everyone. I'm Anna Timmerman. I'm one of the LSU Ag Center Extension agents here in the Juno area. Um, I'm also working pretty extensively with fruit and nut trees down in Plaquemine and St. Bernard Parish. Uh, commercial growers and a lot of home growers. So. Uh, I've been in the New Orleans area for 13 years and I've grown a lot of things, but part of my job is diagnosing and looking at fruit tree projects, orchards. Um, after Katrina, there's a lot of food forests growing in community gardens, stuff like that. So I've kind of had the opportunity over the years to see what works where and maybe what doesn't work. Um, the average homeowner is very reluctant to spray pesticides, right? Insecticides, herbicides, anything like that. Um, low maintenance is always a good thing. <laughs> so when it comes to fruit and nut trees, um, what we choose can really take some of that burden off. Um, so you don't need to spray as much or at all or prune or, you know, really do the heavy duty kind of maintenance things that we think of when we think of an orchard. Um, nine times out of 10, when I see a permaculture project, a food forest, a community garden that's heavy on the fruit trees, I see a lot of disease. I see a lot of insect problems. It really does come down to proper selection of what we're going to plant before we even get to the point where we're thinking about the fruit, right? <laughs> um, so setting people up for success is one of my big passion projects, just so we don't run into problems. <laughs> I see a lot of dead and dying trees, and they're expensive. If we walk out here, those fruit trees are $40, $50 a piece. So we want to make smart decisions when we're planting these things if we're not going to maintain them by spraying regularly or pruning or even mowing when we need them. So I've got three different categories of trees and I'll walk, walk through a little bit about growing for trees and nut trees in the Juno area in general. But I have them kind of broken out into avoid these, they're really difficult unless you're really on top of things, spraying constantly, things that work okay, <laughs> and then things that you can stick out in your yard and you don't have to touch. <laughs> yep. Okay, so, so feel free to stop me uh, if you guys have any questions. So it really does come down to the right plant in the right place. That's something uh, Dan Bell used to say a lot. What's sold at the big box stores, so I'm talking Lowe's, Home Depot, Costco, uh, Tractor Supply, they work on a regional model versus a local model. So they're getting the same shipment of plants that Tennessee or Florida is getting. Oftentimes it's not appropriate cultivars or varieties for our area. I see a lot of plants just right out the box, a cherry tree or an apple tree. Maybe not the best decision for a subtropical area. So just something to think about. They do operate on a regional model. It's always good to shop local. Um, that's what's great about the garden show and the many garden centers that are independently owned in our area is they usually know what works and you can ask questions there. Um, we do live in a very in-between climate. Officially, the USDA has us in 9B um, with the urban heat island effect. You know, concrete buildings, they absorb the sunlight and heat the energy all day long. At night, they radiate heat. We're really more of a 10A, which is really squarely subtropical. We stay a little bit warmer here in Orleans Parish. The river and the lake also act as a heat sink, so we're in a microclimate. We can use that to our advantage. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what microclimates mean, but I do want to point out chill hours. That's something that comes up when you're chopping around for fruit a lot. Chill hours are the amount of hours that we get in the wintertime under 45 degrees Fahrenheit. It has a lot to do with the plant's hormone response and flowering and eventual fruit production. All fruit has to be a flower first, botanically, right? So certain varieties, especially in fruit, need to be exposed to a certain number of hours, minimum amount of hours, under 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Otherwise, they don't get the right response or trigger from the environment you're not going to produce. That's why when you see peach trees in the area, you might get a crop every three years, maybe every six years, depending on the cultivar. It's not a sure thing, but if we get a nice cold winter or we get a lot of hours under 45, you've got a decent set of crops. So something to think about too. We have updated chill hour maps on the Ag Center website. And if you look at this, lower plaquemines, zero to 100 hours below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a lot warmer than the Gino area. We're right at about um, you know, one to 200 hours on average. 
that includes the South Shore, Canterbury, um, New Orleans, suburbs. But then you look at the North Shore, so up here it's Slidell, Covington, Mandeville. Now we're getting into 500 hours plus. So it's a much different climate, even just across the lake, than it is here. We're so much warmer than 95% of the state. So when we're choosing our fruit varieties, we need to choose things that don't rely on those temperatures below 45 degrees. Just some examples of microclimates. Um, I really like this image. These are brick walls, and inside of them are lemon trees. This was in Italy, and this was in the northern, or uh, in France, sorry. Um, this is in a more northern climate than these trees would normally grow on their own, but they're ex explicitly um, building a microclimate out of these brick walls. It shields it from the wind, right, from the cold, freezing weather. The brick acts as a heat sink, it radiates heat all night, so it's actually creating a warmer climate in that little pocket that the tree is in. Um, there's a lot of good examples of this um, in historical gardening before greenhouses were invented. It was a way of pushing fruit into areas that it probably shouldn't grow, but it was successful. Um, fruit walls, that's another name for it, but it really does act as a windbreak. We can do this with where we plant our trees in our yards if we have fencing or maybe a neighbor's house blocking that north wind, that can create a nice microclimate for something like an avocado that's a little more cold sensitive. So something to think about. Uh, you can also grow in containers. We're starting to see patio fruit trees a lot. So you can move them in, move them out. If you do get a freeze, you can push into some of the more tropical stuff that's in my uh, yellow category on the list. And I'll talk more about that. Um, we do see a lot of use of the old school Christmas lights when there's a freeze coming and people covering their fruit trees. Those old Christmas lights, pre-LED, they get hot, right? <laughs> so you can use them, wrap them around your tree, and then put a blanket and tie it at the bottom over the tree and sometimes protect them. And then we'll talk, I've got a good example of burying trees and covering them with heavy mulch. There are people growing banana trees as far north as Kentucky who dig their bananas not all the way out of the ground, but they lay them flat, mulch over them, and then in the spring they chip them back up and they start growing again. So we can really manipulate fruit trees, especially using these microclimate strategies to push the limit on <laughs> what we can grow. Um, here's a good example of a heat pulse sink. This is actually the Epcar kitchen right here. Um, these are clementine trees, there's two of them growing against this brick wall. And it's a spallier, so it's flattened. It's growing along some guide wires. But this heat radiating off the brick in the wintertime really protects these young trees, and I don't have to cover these. I've never covered them. They've been there four years. Um, they're doing great. They're nice and healthy. But that brick wall is creating a microclimate. Something else to think about is more if you have a lot of land, make it a wind break with some taller, maybe evergreen trees. And then when the wind comes, it kind of moves up and over. So you have almost like a barrier that you're, you're creating with other trees or ornamentals in your landscape. So if you have a hedge of like yews, like we have yew hedges all around the garden, and the north wind goes up over that yew, it's creating a little pocket of warmer air. You put fruit tree there. <laughs> so different things you can do. Um, you can also cover trees. I'm starting to see this a lot more with some of my growers where they're putting them under um, what's called a high tunnel or a caterpillar tunnel under a sheet of plastic. And then when it gets cold, they, they button it up. Keeps things a little warmer. Good example of containers. It's getting really easy to find work for the trees, especially some of the retail nurseries that are easier to grow in these 10 gallon pots. And then turning your tree into ghosts. <laughs> Anyone that lives around the Dino area, when we get a freeze warning, You'll see lots of gardeners doing something like this. It creates a nice little pocket um, of air, and as long as this stays dry, it can protect that tree from the freezing wind. Um, I've seen where they, they sell these little greenhouse pop-up tents too, and you see they've got them wrapped in Christmas lights. It's creating a nice little pocket of warm air, protecting that young citrus tree overnight. Here's a good example of burying trees. Um, they do this with pigs a lot in northern climates where they'll actually dig a hole, <laughs> and then it's still rooted in. So they'll tip it down into the hole, 
cover it with a, a brick or something and mulch it real heavy with some hay or some, some beef mold or something like that and create a nice little protected area. It's dormant, and then when it breaks dormancy, they tip it back up and it keeps growing. It's a lot of work, but you can pull it off. Some things to think about with our area. Um, we're one of the wettest places in the continental US. We get 65 to 72 ish inches of rain in a year. Sometimes we get eight inches in a day, right? And it looks like this. Um, moisture in the soil, either from the, the sky or from flood events, is a huge consideration here. Um, most fruit trees really do need drainage. They need good, good drainage. Um, we see a lot of issues of root rot pathogens in this area. It's usually Phycophora, that's kind of the number one culprit. Um, that's a zoo pathogen that can swim through soil moisture. So as long as the soil is wet, it can travel from an infected plant to a different plant. And it will eat the root hairs off of those roots and uh, it causes a lot of decline. Sometimes you can overcome it, but if the soil keeps wet for too long, um, and then it gets into a drought period, like we're in now, we see a lot of dying trees or stretched trees. Um, so just keep in mind, most fruit and nut trees hate wet feet. There's a couple of um, exceptions to that that I'll note when we walk through the, the list. In our area, irrigation um, typically not needed unless there's like a fruit set or a drought. Like right now, we're, we're probably in a five to six week pattern of little to no rain. And you all probably know this. Um, so you might need to go out there and water deeply once a week, which is better than sprinkling daily. Just kind of leave your hose on the gravel. Frost protection um, for deep freezes is kind of rare in our area, but have a plan. Um, in 1987, pretty much every fruit tree got wiped out down here, most of the citrus um, have been planted since 87. And then if you're in an area that does flood, um, which I see in some parts of, of the genome area, soil salinity can be a real problem. If we're getting storm surge um, and it drains out eventually after a storm, it's leaving those salt deposits behind and it takes a while for the rain to flush that soil. So something to think about also. We do like to burn the soil. So even if you're planting a singular fruit tree, it's good to make a little um, landing pad of the native soil. So don't buy bags of potting mix or something like that. Um, you want to use the soil that's already in your yard to build up a little pad 12 to 18 inches. And that gives the roots a place to drain, right? Roots take in water, they take in nutrients, but they also take in oxygen from the soil pores. So in doing this, those, those roots at the top of the berm, even if we get a lot of rain, they're gonna drain a little quicker and they're able to get some oxygen into the system. So we recommend um, berming in the Gino area or planting in containers for a lot of fruit trees, um, especially the things that are sensitive to find copper and root rot, like the citrus. Trellising, um, it's always good to get this in place before you plant, if it's something that you need to trellis. So like our muscadine grapes, um, see, these are blackberries. We can grow some of the low chill blackberries in this area. And then this is a dragon fruit, which is starting to get a lot more popular in this area. It's not very cold hardy, but it's extremely easy to grow if you protect it from frost. But it does climb, it's a, a climbing cactus kind of thing. <laughs> It's good to have a structure for it to hang and tie up. So make sure you get that in place if you need it. And here's an example of what the roots look like after they've been exposed to root rot. This is Phycophora. You see how most of these little root hairs are gone? Yeah. Um, it's, it's dark in coloration. I know the lighting is kind of funky in here. But nice, healthy roots. Um, they're plump. They have kind of a grayish, white, or tan color to them, depending on the species. And there should be millions of root hairs all through here. They're gone because this little guy is munching and eating them. So the tree's not able to take up what it needs if it's damaged to that extent. And that comes from wet, saturated soils. So the big question um, if you're interested in growing fruit in this area, how much care are you willing to put into your backyard, orchard, food forest, or permaculture geology? How much time are you willing to spend on it? Are you willing to spray? Do you want to prune um, or do some trellising that might be a little more intense, like the espalier over there in the kitchen garden? What level of disease and insect control are you going to provide, if any? Are you able to monitor it on a regular basis? Drainage and irrigation. So walking the yard or the site and kind of 
making a note of any low areas or maybe the areas that drain a little quicker. Fertilizer or pH adjustment. A uh, good example of this is if you're trying to grow blueberries in the New Orleans area, our pH is pretty high and basic for them. They really do prefer an acidic soil. So you might have to put some sulfur out to help drop that pH in the soil for them to be successful. Or put them in a container. Uh, frost protection, are you willing to run out there frantically when we get the, the frost warning and cover them? And then thinning our hand pollination when it comes to fruit. Some of the more tricky types of fruit, um, you might have to go out there with a, a paintbrush and hand pollinate. Are you willing to do that? So think about how much care you're willing to put in and that's going to guide your choices. That being said, you can baby anything along. There are exceptions to everything on the list. Um, if you look under the do not plant avoid, apples are at the very top, right? Every couple of years, I'll come across a beautiful apple tree, loaded with fruit, healthy as can be, and it's, it's rare, but they're out there. <laughs> Same thing with peaches. Um, you can, as long as you're willing to put the care and the effort into it, sometimes you can really push the limits on what, what these things do. Um, choosing the right fruits for your space. You really don't want to crowd things. Anytime we crowd, especially trees or woodies like blueberries, um, crowding does lead to poor pollination. It can lead to more pest and disease problems too. Um, choose fruits and nuts that fit your maintenance abilities on plants. Grow what you enjoy. If you don't like eating something, don't grow it. <laughs> if you make figs, why would you have a fig tree kind of thing? Um, and then select cultivars and types that like our microclimate, and I'll break that down when we get into the list. And really think about those chill hour needs if it's something that needs that cold exposure uh, to even fruit. So, you guys ready for the list? Okay. I have built this list out of 13 years of looking at fruit trees. So, I hope you enjoy it and um, take that reference sheet when you're shopping. So, getting into the red category first. Um, if you're not willing to put any work, any spraying into your fruit trees, avoid these. <laughs> Just don't even go there. Apples, um, the one cultivar, for me it's easy to remember, Anna occasionally does well. If I see a beautiful apple tree down in St. Bernard or out in Metairie, it's usually an Anna. <laughs> um, you treat them here as a short crop, three to seven years, that's because of the root rot problem. They decline very slowly over time, and the market gardeners I've worked with, um, they'll actually plan to replace them every three to five years, or seven years. They're very sensitive to Phytophthora root rot, but they also have fire blight problems as well. Um, all of the northern stone fruits, so things with that, that heavy pit in the center, um, cherries, plums, peaches, apricots, just don't, don't go there. <laughs> um, it's up for break. Um, some of the more successful peaches I've seen, they are not producing every year. There's a white, kind of Saturn-like peach um, that I see in the bywater quite often. Every three to five years, they might get a good crop. Um, that's something, you know, looking for those old unnamed cultivars, you can really go off the deep end looking for them. But if you're going to the garden center and you see a peach tree at Costco, it's probably not going to grow here. Um, it might last through the summer, but then it's gone. Chill hours are really important. Um, the locally adapted cultivars are being looked at. So there's actually three or, four, three or four of us statewide looking for that peach tree in the bywater and collecting the, the pits off of it and growing them. <laughs> um, so we're hoping to release some of those locally adapted things that can take our conditions um, in the next few years. Disease pressure is especially high, um, so we just avoid it. Wine and table grapes. Um, so not muscadine, but like traditional, you know, what you eat fresh or, or create a wine from. Blanche de Bois is the only one I've seen make a reliable crop in our area. Um, luckily, it's in production, so you can get it at local garden centers. Again, high disease pressure, so if you're not out there spraying, pruning, thinning, it's not going to make a new crop for you. Raspberries. Um, again, very high disease pressure, and they have chill hour requirements into the upper hundreds, most of the cultivars, but there's some breeding being done um, where they're making low chill raspberries for our area. Um, some breeding being done in Texas, so that's something coming down the pipeline. But when you go to Tractor Supply or Walmart and you see the little square pots with the, the one stick of raspberry cane, it's probably not something that's going to grow here, unfortunately. 
Um, with pears, Southern Bartlett works really good in our area if you can find it. Um, it's an old timey kind of cooking pear. It's hard, it's not good for fresh eating, but it's great if you're making pies or canning. <coughs> Again, I just use pressure, chill hours are a concern, it might not always be. Um, but that's one that Southern Bartlett is pretty good. Uh, mangoes uh, needs cold protection. It's a true tropical, but every once in a while, uh, has anyone tried to save the big seed out of the mango? And they die, right? <laughs> uh, we're not quite hot enough yet um, for the mangoes to really get much. However, guavas, I'm looking at five or six different guavas. Some of the Mexican cultivars are actually doing really well in our area. Um, we've gotten a little warmer in the last few years. We've been bumped up in USDA climate zone. And the pineapple wild especially does phenomenal. But look at some of the Mexican cultivars. Um, they do need some cold protection, but you can start them easily from seed. It's easy to order seeds online. And they're reliably fruiting for quite a few people that I know growing. They might freeze back to the ground each year, but they're so quickly, um, or quick growers, that I've been seeing people harvest this year especially. It's been a very good flop of year. That's one to look at. Currants. You guys know what currants are? They're like a little northern fruit. Don't even try. <laughs> Same thing with gooseberries. Um, currants and gooseberries, and we're getting into quince as well. Really more northern, upper Midwest, into Canada, um, Pacific Northwest. Not a lot of cultivars that do well past um, kind of like the Mason Dixon line area. Heat issues. Coconut palm. Anyone tried this for a coconut? We did it here at the park. <laughs> um, they will grow sometimes, but they get so tall and they're not cold hardy that they get killed by the winters, um, even if we don't get below freezing that much. Um, jackfruit and breadfruit, occasionally I'll see people saving seed from Hong Kong market. Uh, jackfruit tree gets 100 feet, 100 feet. Where are you gonna put it? It needs to be in a greenhouse. You'd have to have a, like a Q style conservatory to set it off. Um, most of us don't have the space in our house. <laughs> but it does make an attractive little glossy leaf plant for a little while before it goes. Um, almonds, I know somebody growing two almond trees in St. Bernard, but again, they don't like the wet conditions or the high humidity, lots of bacterial leaf spot problems. And now they're starting to succumb to root rot as well. Um, almonds are typically grown in sandy, well-draining soils. So we think about where they're grown in Southern California or where they're grown in the commercial, not where they're grown. Uh, well-draining kind of looser soils, not the clay way that we have. American chestnut, um, high disease pressure. You all know about the chestnut blight that basically wiped out all the American chestnuts when the Chinese ones were brought in. There is some crossbreeding with the Chinese cultivars happening. And they're getting some really good crops with these low genetics, so it'll be 95% American DNA in the chestnut tree, 5% Chinese, something like that, a low, low percentage. Gives it just enough disease resistance to overcome that blight, and we can actually grow chestnuts very successfully in this area. Um, a couple of major nurseries in Belchase are now growing chestnut trees, mostly for deer food plots, because deer is another wildlife really like chestnuts. Um, for your backyard, if they get very large, might not be the best bet. But if you have some land across the lake, you might want to think about it. Some things to try. So now we're in the yellow category. Again, there's that guava. Uh, Mexican cream and strawberry guavas, um, other high altitude Mexican cultivars are doing really well. Some of them don't have names that we're looking at, but I'm growing some out with some friends, and we've been really impressed with that Mexican cream. Really good tasting fruit, very easy to grow. It does free back, freeze back, but even if it's chilled completely down in the spring, it'll be this tall by July. It's got plenty of time to set it down. What about that hardy pink one? That one did pretty good too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if you can find it. I had trouble sourcing the seed of the pink flush one. Avocado. Um, Haas and super Haas. So if you're saving the pit from the store, they're typically a cultivar that doesn't grow outside of where that came from. They're not cold hardy or disease resistant enough for New Orleans. The ones that we like, Joey and Lila. And you can get those at the garden centers. 
You also need two for good pollination. And they have different kinds of flowers. There's type A flowers and type B. You need one of each so they can cross pollinate and set fruit correctly or at a good rate. Joey and Lila are a perfect match for our area. So if you're going to shop for avocados, get one of each and plant them about 15 feet apart. That's what we have over here. And we picked avocados this year even though the trees are pretty new. Um, but if you save a pit from the store, not going to make it to maturity, not going to set fruit in our area, unfortunately. Unless you happen to find something like Joey and Lila genetics, which is kind of rare. Not in, not in commercial production, you know, so that can happen. Pawpaw, um, you guys know what a pawpaw is? It's North America's largest native fruit. It tastes like a, a banana y mango kind of thing. I have pictures of a lot of these coming up. Uh, it has been traded and spread around the waterways by indigenous people for a long time. We have them in Louisiana. Most of the pawpaw festivals are in North, the northern um, New England states, into the Midwest, um, Indiana, New York, those areas. But we can grow pawpaw in New Orleans and they make fruit. It's a kind of a spindly understory tree, um, but it makes a, a good size fruit if you get one of the native cultivars. Um, I'm working on some research uh, with somebody in St. Bernard Parish where we're actually selecting native cultivars from Louisiana for the best size fruit, best taste. And we're trying to get some commercial production going here because you can make gear out of it. People um, go crazy for it in the farmer's market. It's a very unique flavor. Um, they do need shade when they're young and established and get sunburned. So it's good to plant them under like a live oak or some kind of tree canopy to get them going. Or you can put shade cloth kind of around them for a few years and leave the top open so that it grows up through and it's somewhat protected. Um, if you're interested in pawpaws, December 3rd is a pawpaw symposium in Bureau, Louisiana, about 15 minutes from here. <laughs> if you Google New Orleans pawpaw symposium, it will come up. Blueberries need that lower soil pH, so more acidic soil. That's why they grow really well on the North Shore where we see a lot of pine trees. But in the New Orleans area, um, most Average backyards are fill dirt or some kind of river sand. It's usually about a 7.5 or higher pH. Um, you can augment that, or you can plant them into a raised bed or a container. It's good to have um, several types for good cross pollination. So I always tell people get at least three bushes, two different varieties. That way, when they flower, you get better fruit set and good pollination. Um, rabbit eye and southern kind bush are the two types that do well in the New Orleans area, and that's what they're selling here in most of the garden centers. Strawberries, we treat them like an annual here. I know uh, in more northern parts of the country, they'll establish a strawberry patch and they'll pick from it for years. You can't do that here. <laughs> they get so many diseases. Um, the best time to plant is October, so right about now. I know that seems counterintuitive because all the garden centers sell their strawberry plums in the springtime. But if you want to pick tons and tons of strawberries, order them online, plant them now, and you'll start picking in January and they'll go into May. So that's that's the timeline here. I'll go to the garden center and just want to pick up on it. The best varieties I've found for this area are Camino Real, Camo Rosa, that's mostly what they're growing in Monte And then there's a new one called Ruby June. It's very aromatic. It's got a really sweet flavor. It bruises easy, so it's not a good shipping strawberry like for the grocery store, but for your backyard, that's a really good one. <laughs> easy to grow, too. Arbanus cherry. Um, I have pictures of this coming up because it's kind of unusual. Two of the larger nurseries are producing them. It's a tropical cherry-shaped fruit. It's got three or four little seeds in the middle. It tastes very similar to a traditional uh, sweet cherry like you can get up north. Um, a little thicker skin to it, but it's a good cherry alternative for our area. It's a subtropical tree. Um, they're doing great. If you protect them from frost, either in a container or in the ground, that's one of the better new introductions for our area. Um, Barbados cherry. I'll show you what it looks like here in a second. Star fruit. Y'all have seen the, the star-shaped fruit at the grocery store. Um, if you protect it, from cold, it does awesome. 
<laughs> Believe it or not, there's a at least 10-year-old one down in St. Bernard Parish that somebody's picking a few dozen off each winter. So if you can protect it, start fruit. And you can buy trees online. Um, Jujubes, or Jujubes, depending on how you pronounce it, I've heard it called those. Uh, I have pictures of that too. It's um, more of like a, an Eastern fruit. Uh, they can get very sweet. You protect them from cold, the trees will get 30 feet tall and bear tons of fruit. Um, that's a relatively new introduction. Kiwi vines, so they're a little bit smaller fruit than what you'd buy at the grocery store, but you can grow kiwis here. Um, yeah. It's uh, Texas A&M, SFA University in East Texas. They have a really big kiwi fruit breeding program, and they have one called Gulf Coast that does all the standing here. You do need to protect it from the cold, and you need a male and a female vine to go to pollinate because the male vine will make male flowers, the female will have female flowers, so you need one of each, and it needs a um, But if you follow anything Texas is doing with kiwis, they've got a ton of info out there. Dragon fruit, um, I saw somebody selling dragon fruit cuttings. It's kind of like a cactus, <laughs> um, but it does climb. Dried or yellow fruit, if you protect it from cold, it's super easy to grow here. It gets big and sprawly on the trellis, um, and the fruit is very exotic looking and delicious. Papaya, you see them all over town. It's very easy to grow from seed. It grows like a weed, right? But you have to protect it from the cold. Occasionally, it'll regrow from the stump. It's good to have multiple trees, because sometimes the male or female trees, and occasionally they get one with both. So having multiple trees is good. Grip fruit. Um, I tell folks to avoid planting grape fruit in the New Orleans area because of high disease pressure. They really do need to be protected from citrus canker. The bacterial leaf spot that they get and it's all over the fruit and it looks like it has acne. But you can spray copper on a six week basis um, to protect it, but most homeowners aren't willing to spray every six weeks. So that's something to think about if you're willing to spray, you can do it. Limes and lemons, um, they freeze back a lot. If anyone's ever tried to plant one and not protected it from the cold, the rootstock comes up and the pop dies out. I've talked to a few people today where that's happened. Um, again, high canker pressure, but these are the ones that we like in this area. Persian limes, key limes. The one that's doing incredibly well is the finger limes. You guys know what a finger lime is? It looks like your thumb. And when you break it open, um, it's full of little beads of like caviar, full of juice. You know, when you slice a lemon, you've got kind of a membrane and it's full of, full of juice. Really interesting. I have some good photos coming up of that also. The finger limes are more hardy, more disease resistant. Um, the cocktail bars really like them because they use them in the fancy drinks. And the chefs really love them because they use them as garnish. It's like a little pop of lime flavor when you bite into them. Super easy to grow. Um, the caviar lime, which is the one you cook with the leaves, that does very well in this area. In the lemon category, Ponderosa does okay. Meyer and Improved Meyer. The pinker variegated ones tend to be very weak. I know they're super popular because they're pretty, but if they have a variegated leaf, some kind of lemon, or the um, lemonade, pink lemonade lemons, they're just not as vigorous as the Improved Meyer. Um, that's one you definitely want to keep in a pot and really baby along. Navel oranges, sweet oranges, tangerine, tangelo, mandarin, and blood orange. Again, high disease pressure. Um, with the blood orange, every year it doesn't fail. People pick them and they're like, why aren't they red on the inside? They need exposure to cold for them to turn red. Um, it's an anthocyanin is the, the compound that they need cold exposure to develop, and then they turn red on the inside. That's why you see where they're like beaten little bit, bits and pockets of red. But if you leave the fruit out into March, and you might get a late freeze or two, they'll color up mm -hmm. on the inside. So something to think about, not every year we'll get enough chill hours, but some years they're really red if you let them hang on the tree a lot longer than you think. Um, some ones I'm looking at, the native plums, Chickasha, Cherokee plum, Sand plum, um, there are wild plums that have been spread by indigenous people for many years. They're native source southern genetics, and sometimes you can buy them at native plant sales. They make a very small fruit, uh, but it's good for making things like jams and jellies. The flavor is good. Um, they need good drainage, kind of sandier soils, or a berm to plant into, but they do really good in our area. Pineapple, has anyone saved the top? 
They do great, <laughs> but you have to protect them from cold. If you save the top from your pineapple, let it dry out for a couple of days, plant it in some potting soil in the pot, it's a bromelia. Treat it like your other bromeliads. And it will make up fruit in two to three years, usually about yay big or smaller, incredibly sweet, but if you protect them from cold, they do good. I've seen where people make a whole hedge of them. Every week they buy a pineapple, <laughs> and they have a nice little room of pineapples. <laughs> um, yeah, but again, you gotta cover them if we do get a freeze. Um, Rose Garden Center from the West Bank has been carrying things called sugar apples. And I have a picture of that too. It's a tropical fruit. As long as you cover it, it has a long ripening process. So once the fruit forms, it might be nine months before it's actually ripe. But it, uh, it tastes incredibly sweet. You break it open and eat it. Um, those do okay. Date palms. Um, every year we get calls about you know the palm nuts. They're out right now. Technically, yes, you can eat them if you want to. Probably not. The actual true date palms are pretty rare in our area. Um, they're not as cold tolerant as you really need, um, or they can't really handle our rainfall. Long maturation time, you need to have female trees for this set. So if you have some land, you could probably play with that. And then the Chinese chestnuts and the Chinese eucalyptus chestnuts. We're getting some good reports of those. Wait, you skip right over the pomegranate. Oh, which sure. is my most problematic for trees. <laughs> pomegranate. The fruit mummifies. There's a post bloom fruit drop pathogen. And then there's another pathogen that um, impacts the rind and it turns, yeah. turns it kind of dry on the inside. It's mummified food, basically. You have to spray a fungicide every six weeks. Yeah, from the time you see the flower, the time the fruit is ready, which is a pretty long, usually eight to nine months in our area. Um, really susceptible to bacterial leaf spots, to and canaria, pretty much all of them. So, you, you've probably seen them with, around town where they, they'll freeze back and get super crazy too. They turn into bushes. Mm -hmm. I tell people avoid pomegranate unless they're willing to get out there and get them on the fungicide like Jackanel, something a little heavier than copper. Because it's, it's really tough. I know they love to sell them here. <laughs> um, the dwarf pomegranate, I think it's on my, my go for it list. Mm -hmm. um, they make a little fruit. They're somewhat resistant to that mummification. So, mm -hmm. yeah. it's. They're fussy, they're high maintenance. Yeah, I'm thinking about pulling that out. A lot of people do. <laughs> okay, recommend it. Okay, so now we're in the green light list. If you don't want to do like spraying out there every weekend or every month or, or worrying about covering and moving things in, let's get into that. Because <laughs> I don't have time to pull that kind of stuff either. The first one that always kind of surprises people olives. Oops. Um, yeah, olives. We actually looked at an olive trial at the Hammond Research Station on the North Shore, and we found the Spanish cultivars and one from Portugal did outstanding in their climate. Um, you may have seen kind of silvery foliage trees in people's yards. Those are olive trees a lot of the time. Um, it's easy to find Arbutina. That's the one that they're selling. Um, they were selling yesterday at the fruit tree stand. Um, most of the garden centers carry it. It makes a small olive um, that's green when it's unripe. It turns kind of dark purple when it ripens. You can cure them. It's kind of an extensive process to make like green olives or cocktail olives. And you can buy, I just found out, a tabletop press to press your own olive oil mm -hmm. if you're that ambitious. They're very small, but if you shake the tree, the ripe ones fall and you can rake them up. And believe it or not, in St. Bernard Parish, there is a olive orchard. This is their first pressing of local olive oil. And in Texas, there's a pretty extensive industry. So it's starting to take off. But they're really attractive trees, and they don't need anything. They don't need any pruning, really. You could shape them however you want. No pest or disease problems that may be found, even in Hammond or here. Um, they're really great. Really, the, the big downside is you got to do some curing or some pressing if you want to use the fruit. But it's just such an attractive tree, it's being used as an ornamental a lot. And it doesn't get huge either. You'd be dead before it got huge. So, <laughs> yeah, we would all be gone. <laughs> um, grapes, muscadine grape is native to this area. Um, really great to eat um, fresh or to press into juice or wine. We had a winemaking demo 
up here yesterday and they shared a musky and wine recipe with everyone and they did a YouTube video. So if you Google LSU eggs or musky and wine, you can get the recipe. Um, I like to make jelly out of them. They're very hearty. They do need trellising and once you're leaf rooting, we go to do um, some of the different clusters and we'll thin it out and train it along the wire. That's how you get really good fruit production. Um, Mississippi State has muscadine field day and field trials, and they're breeding different thinner skin or seedless muscadines, because that's one of the big downsides. Sometimes you have a chewy skin, or they have big seeds in the center. The one that I really like is black beauty, and you can get that at the garden centers now. Um, but they're releasing more every year. Um, black ones, purple ones, yellow skinned ones, um, kind of a russet red colored muscadine. There's something for everyone. Blackberries. Um, the University of Arkansas is the southern breeding program, and I'm seeing their releases in our area. These are some good ones. Um, high pest and disease pressure and unreliable harvest, but we're seeing some of the new cultivars like Primark Freedom, or um, yeah, Primark Freedom, Primark 45, Iowa. They're doing okay. Um, and I'm looking at blackberries and sacred arborists this year. Um, so that's something, if you do see blackberries, make sure you buy them local and not in a big box store so you're getting a good cultivar. The local garden centers know which ones grow here, but I found them at Walmart, I found them at Home Depot, and they're usually a, a more northern cultivar that's not going to fruit reliably for our area. So try to buy local blackberries. Figs, they do incredibly well. <laughs> like, plant it and forget about it. <laughs> Very easy. They do require some pruning because they prune most of them on the new wood. So if you go through each year and just kind of clean them up, maybe limb them up, um, you can you can top them if they get too tall, pick comfortably. Go ahead and lock them, and they'll be okay. Um, we mostly grow the closed or partially closed eye types. So if you look at a fig fruit, there's an eye at the bottom. The more closed it is, the better pest and disease resistance it has. Um, if anyone's trying to grow LSU bowl, it's a more open pie, and they kind of fall apart on the tree before they're ripe. Um, they rot from the inside out, so that's the only one I really avoid. Um, but Celeste, improved Celeste, LSU bowl, or LSU purple, and brown turkey. Those are really easy to source locally in your grape. Um, we don't have the fig wasp. Has anyone heard of the fig wasp that pollinates the things? doesn't live in Louisiana. They have it in um, California. They've established and brought it in where a lot of the commercial fig orchards are. Here in Louisiana, we need the self-pollinating ones. But most of what you buy at the garden center will fall into the category. Mm -hmm. Super easy. If you want to grow a fruit tree and look good, put a fig in. Um, passion fruits. Anyone grow your passion fruits? Yeah, I've got one too. Um, we have a native passion fruit, cassiflor and carnata. Um, there's one on the butterfly fence here. It's the, the big passion flower, but then if you look closely, there's a couple of fruits forming. They're kind of egg-shaped and green right now, but they'll turn more of a purpley color. Really great in a cocktail. <laughs> and you can make jams and jellies out of them too. They are host plants um, for the, the fritillary butterfly, and they'll eat it down to the ground, um, but it comes back. So no big pest or disease problems there. There are tropical passion fruits that are sold. Um, sometimes you can get the red flowered ones or some really exotic looking passion fruits. Um, they're not as hardy when we get a freeze. They don't always come back after they die back. Um, so you might have to mulch them there. But in general, if you put in that incarnata, the, the classic purple, or there's a white sport of it where the flower's all completely white, they do great. Yeah, see? <laughs> It's popping up through the lawn and stuff. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other good one, plant it, forget about it, mulberry. They're everywhere, right? They're a weed. But though the wild ones, the fruit's not always great, they're kind of seedy or not very sweet, you can buy cultivated mulberries um, if you're interested in making jellies and stuff like that. The Persian cultivars do really good in this area. They're kind of long, skinny fruits, and they're um, easier to pick. So something to look at. Um, you can actually whack most of the tree back each year, and it's called pollarding, and it will sprout back out and control the size that way. Um, do it in a couple of schoolyards where the tree got too big. It's 
Cut it all back and throw it back to fresh. That's one of the only ones I'll recommend that kind of drastic action for. But no pasture disease problem with no um, If you do want to grow citrus, satsumas, very cold hardy for our area. Um, get the grafted trees that give them some added disease resistance. They're resistant to citrus canker. We did a study a few years ago where we found they won't kill them. So they can get some spots on the leaves and some fruit and they're fine. Um, the ones we like in this area, Owari, early St. Anne, um, Brown Select, and then these ones, Arctic Frost and Bumper, we can actually grow in the first floor. They can get down to 14 degrees in the night. So that's some new genetics. And then if you can find it, Golden Nugget, best flavor. <laughs> um, yeah, Satsumas are a good bet. Calamites and Kumquats, very, very cold hardy, very low disease pressure. With the kumquats, Miwa is the sweet one, Nagami is the sour one. So when you're shopping, if you like them sweet or if you like them sour, make sure you pick the right one. Um, and then with the calamondins, um, typically they're juiced. I see people juicing them a lot. They're, they're kind of round, mini oranges almost. Very ornamental tree. They're great on a patio. Um, they'll hold their fruit, and it's kind of nice for a long time. Bananas and plantains do incredibly well in our area. They grow like weeds. If you want a good eating banana, the one I'm seeing around a lot is Blue Java. It's the, what's called on the internet the ice cream banana. So you can freeze them and they taste like vanilla ice cream. Um, they tend to clump too. They're not as aggressively growing, um, which I found also. It's a nice little bonus. Um, once they do make bananas, you have to cut them back because they're never going to make bananas again. Um, but they send up plenty of pups each year. Um, and they're pretty easy to transplant as well. Low flat, Japanese plum, mist leaves, depending on what neighborhood you're in. Very, very easy. Y'all know what tree I'm talking about with the, the little golden fruit. Um, it's naturalized here. It was actually brought in a couple hundred years ago. Yeah, I didn't see quite I had a number of them. They were big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they kept getting this rusty color on them, so I used the copper. Yep. And they went back, and then I had my friend watch them over the summer. When I came back, my trees were all dead. They were, I had them for nine years, oh, but no. I bought them, they were big. It was like $600. Oh, no. What do you think happened? Was it on the leaves, the rusty color? I, 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 it's been there before. He didn't notice, but I've treated them with copper many yeah. times. It might have been something like a, a bacterial leaf spot that just got them. Because we had a really wet summer. If you were gone for the summer, um, we could have ran a, a test on that to know exactly what it was. But the, yes, it could have been from the wet, hot summer. It probably was, yeah, without knowing specifically the pathogen. Yeah, that's unfortunate because they usually don't have a lot of pest and disease issues where they kind of in a shaded, maybe wetter area or growing close together. I, he thinks the mistake I made was they were in very, very large pots. They were stressed. So a stressed tree, low pot wants to get big. If we can find it to a pot without regularly pulling it out every year, shearing some of the roots off, pruning it real heavy, it's going to be kind of fighting against that pot all summer. They dry out, they dry out, it's hard to keep them watered. If it's stressed, it's more susceptible to a pathogen. That's what happens. So it might have been a bacterial leaf spore, which it could have been um, like a canker or a rust pathogen without knowing exactly, but it was a stress. It makes it very susceptible. Um, a lot of these trees, they want to be big. They want to be 25, 30 feet sometimes. Um, elderberries, super easy, right? It's a weed here. People pay money for elderberries up north. Can you believe it? They're on every empty lot in the world. Um, there are some selected cultivars um, that make nicer clusters of fruit or a bigger size berry um, that you can buy out of the, the nursery catalogs. I've never seen them offered locally, but they are native and naturalized. Elderberry is super easy to grow. Um, prickly pear, we don't think of it as a fruit, but it is. Grows super easy in the ground here. I see where they get almost as big as some houses in some neighborhoods, and they make an edible fruit. You can juice the fruit, make jams and jellies, um, when you pick it, you have to wear gloves because there are tiny spikes on the fruit too. But the hack I found with that is you use um, a pair of like barbecue tongs and a lighter and you singe those little spikes off and then you can handle them and cook with them. And they're really, really good. Um, no pest or disease issues. Sometimes they get a little cold damage because they're super hardy. 
American persimmon is our native persimmon. They make small fruits like this, really great for birds and other wildlife, um, but the flavor is good. Uh, they're also great for cooking with. Uh, you can make persimmon bread or wine or something like that, jelly. Very easy, but again, it's a tree. It wants to get 30, 40 feet tall. So you've got to have room for it. If you don't have a lot of room, go with an Asian persimmon. Um, there's some for sale out there. Fuyu, uh, Kaninashi, and Sudura. Very easy. Um, I'm seeing persimmon ripen all around town. Maybe 15 feet tall trees, maybe 15 feet wide. They turn um, yellow or golden colored, but if they're still rock hard, they're not ripe right. And they're very stringent if you try to eat them. You make your mouth pucker up. So you want to wait to pick them so they're like so squishy they're almost falling into your hand. It helps if they go through a freeze. So if you can hold off and wait and the raccoons aren't getting into your trees, the longer they can stay on the tree, the better. You got that problem? I had an issue with the date and black and how you get to the tree. It's like the second time of that. It might be something in the bubble. Yeah, yeah it might be Anna Durham, might even. So, uh, should be sure. I will. Yeah. <laughs> um, in general, the Asian persimmons, not a lot of pests and disease problems, but it is a tree, so it needs good drainage. So, it should be a root rot problem. And they're selling them here. If you have a wet yard that holds water, like many of us in New Orleans, they hawk. Is a fruit tree that can really handle that. Um, they like to grow in river bottoms. It's native to Louisiana. And if anyone's had Mayha jelly, it's fabulous. You can make uh, little fruits about yay big. Um, there is a Louisiana, Louisiana Mayha Association and some commercial Mayha orchards on the North Shore where you can go pick Mayhaws and it's all about a gallon to make Mayha wine. But the jelly is really a, kind of a local food you know, specialty. So if you have a wet yard, pop a Mayha. Um, pecan, we see them all over town. People have been growing them here forever. Super easy. Um, it's good to get grafted tree. They're a little more disease and cold tolerant. Um, but in general, they're alternate bearing, so don't expect pecan every year. Um, they take a year off if they have a bumper crop. There's nothing wrong with what they do. Um, very easy to grow. The paper shell cultivars. LSU has a pretty good um, publication on growing pecans. But the ones you see in the garden centers around here will be great. Um, miracle fruit. Anyone heard of miracle fruit? Yeah. Um, pretty new. I've got a picture of it coming up. You eat it and it makes sour things taste sweet, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's used in a lot of weight loss or natural diets, but also it's super easy to grow and it's a really fun plant. So I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. No pest or disease problems here known, but you got to protect it from frost. It is tropical. They grow really easy here, um, and I'm starting to see it pop up more and more. Roselle hibiscus, you guys know what that is out there? You actually make a tea or a jelly or a simple syrup out of the um, flower calyx, so it's not a true fruit, but it, you pick it like a fruit. If you go out to the kitchen garden, it's the hibiscus looking plant with the red on the stalks. Really easy to grow, it's just like growing an okra. And you can make um, like a, a Jamaican red tea, you can make jellies, it's used in cocktails a lot. Um, you can check it out over there. Black walnut and black cherry, both native to our area, but they need a lot of space and a lot of drainage. The black cherry is one of our best wildlife trees in the area. They make lots of fruit. Um, they're also a host plant for several hundred species of moths, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have room for a black cherry, pop one in, I put one in at my house. Because I learned about this, they make cherry bounce. Who's heard of cherry bounce? Okay, the older folks in the room know what I'm talking about. I didn't know what that was, and I was pretty new on the job, and I went out to a man's house in Metairie to look at his black cherry trees, and they make little fruits kind of like this. It's a liquor that you make out of those fruits, and it is, um, I think, Sicilian, right? I'm not sure. Okay. I'm surprised that it, it, came, it was something that they made um, with the Italian immigration lady here. And it's called Cherry Bounce. And then they came in and picked it up. And they make it in a lot of <laughs> So you can, you can do something with those little fruits. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at some of these unusual things. Here's a, a Barbados cherry. The fruits maybe, right, yeah, Chris has one. Chris, do you love your Barbados cherry? I love it. It's so cute. It's got little pink flowers on it right now and fruit. It's flowering and fruity. Okay, and yours is in a pot, right? In a pot, yeah. That's 
<laughs> yeah, our vendors carry, you can get that in the Bell Chase fruit stands where they sell fruit trees along Highway 23. It's a green you find at the garden center too. This it's been rebranded by uh, Southern Living as the Sweet Southern Cherry. Okay. <laughs> it's not a true tree. Trademark. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It's a tropical <laughs> tree. It's not a real cherry, but it's a, it's a good tree, right? It is. Yeah, very easy. Pawpaw. Um, there's a couple guys in the Bywater picking pawpaw fruit every year, and they sell them in the restaurants. You cut it open, and it's got kind of a, a banana texture to it and some big seeds. Um, you cook with the pulp or you make desserts and pastries out of it. Pastry chefs will go back after this. Um, really crazy. We're starting to get some of our farmers to grow it as a commercial crop because it doesn't have a good shelf life. When it's ready, it's ready and it's ready for a day. When you try to put it in a box and they're touching one another, they bruise and they rot <laughs> like immediately. So it is a true fresh fruit crop. Have you seen it at a farmer's market? This was the first year I saw it. The uptown one on Tuesday. Yeah, I'm sure they don't have them anymore, but yeah, I was surprised. Guava, if you haven't had a guava before, you slice into it. Uh, this is that pink, pink interior guava. And then star fruit, really beautiful one down in Metairie, or not Metairie, in Chalmette, but you do have to protect it from cold most of these. Juice, juby. Um, we went out a person ride to a farm in Czech Bay, so down to the Oklahoma area, kind of 30 foot tall tree, loaded with these fruits. In Asian cultures, they dry them almost like a raisin or a fruit, and it's a really nice delicacy. Um, here's that hearty kiwi. See, it's a little different than the grocery store kiwi. They clusters. Um, they come in green interior, pink, yellow, when you slice them open. Really interesting fruit. And then this is the dragon fruit. I see a lot of folks in New Orleans East growing this in the Vietnamese community. Super easy to start from cuttings, like little cactus cuttings. Give it a trellis, and it does this. <laughs> they come in yellow or red. Here's that sugar apple you can get at Rose Garden Center. It takes a really long time to ripen, but it makes these little um, like edible cups inside with the seed. Really, really, really sweet. Super sweet. And then the Chinese chestnut, it's, it's spiky on the outside, but when they're ripe, they split open. And here's those chestnuts that you roast or, you know, bake with. Um, and it, it's a fairly large tree, but these are doing outstanding, especially on the North Shore. But I'm also starting to see them in the Belt Chase area, too, because they've been out for long enough to start making fruit, and uh, they're bearing a good crop. Maypop, walk right over there in the Butterfly Garden, you'll see this fruit. Um, that's another one that grows super easy. And here's that miracle fruit um, that you can sometimes buy. I've only found these on the um, internet, but you can get them pretty easy. Roselle hibiscus out there in the garden, you can take a look. And then look at these prickly pear fruits. You can actually cook with those and make jelly or, or eat them fresh. They're fantastic. Persian mulberry, look at how much nicer that is to pick than the little ones we're used to seeing. Um, they make these really long groups, um, and they have a better flavor. They've been bred and hybridized in the Middle East for centuries, so they're really nice um, and harvestable. <laughs> so where to buy these things, definitely buy local as much as you can. We have two wholesale nurseries on the West Bank, Saxon Becknell and Sons and Star Nursery. That's who's supplying a lot of fruit trees to the independent garden centers. So if you shop at Carol's or Bantings or Plagues, you can ask them, you know, where are you getting your fruit trees from? And even though you can't walk into some of these places and buy them because they're wholesale only, your retail garden center can order one in the next truck. So you can always ask them, like, hey, can you get one of these in for me? Um, Citrus Trees Nola has a website and sometimes he vends here. He has a lot of these fruit trees available right in Metairie, and he sells them online or you can go to his house. Um, Bracey's is on the North, North Shore, it's a wholesale nursery, but they also propagate a lot of fruit trees and, and things like blackberries especially and sell to the garden centers. So if there's something you saw in this presentation, you can ask for it and Bracey's might have it. Good Garden Retail Centers, this is my list. Jefferson Fee, the one on the Dow Highway, the original one. Arena, Charvets, Bantings, Plagues, Urban Roots, up on top of Tulis, carries a lot of different fruits. Harold's in the Bywater, the Plant Gallery on our airline highway, they have a lot in the garden center. If you're going to mail order things, 
Strawberry plugs its time. Give strawberries. Last in Canyon nursery was mail order. Low jeans, rare and tropical plants can have the unusual stuff. Four winds for citrus, stunt brothers, and mail. So that's where you get them from if you don't see them here today. Any questions? I know that was a lot. <laughs> so you were talking about like how the prickly pears grow here. Well, mm -hmm. I have some and they do, but they're getting scale. Now I tried uh, on some like a detergent, a copper. Well, that killed them. Is there anything else that can help them with the scale? Did you try the neem oil or? That killed them. Okay. What about the all season horticultural oil, the lighter culture fine oil? Did you try it's, that? It seems like anything I put on the leaves, the leaves turn white and die. It might be the actual scale that's turning white, or is it the flesh? It's the flesh. It's the flesh. Okay. Everyone I've treated died. The ones I haven't treated are struggling along. Are they in the full sun? Yes. Whenever you spray something in the full sun, you want to make sure you do it on cloudy days, because it can sometimes magnify, especially some of the things we just mentioned. And it will burn, so you might have scorched it. Is there like a like a root, <coughs> like a systemic thing I could use? Instead? Not anything illegal. The EPA pulled some of that stuff. Oh, like you can't get it anymore. It's hard to find the pump. If you find it, it's older product that's been on the shelf for a while because they stopped offering it to a lot of homeowners. Oh. Um, sometimes you can get it on like bare advanced fruit and tree stuff. Fruit shrub and tree. But how do you spell bare? B a y e r. It comes in a blue bottle. A Y oh like bear aspirin. Yes. Bear so advanced. If you look up bear fruit tree, you bear might still be able to find it. Yeah, that's one that you can try to do Yeah. So my fig um, had a great crop and then lost all of its leaves. Yep. And now the leaves are coming back. Mm -hmm. Normal? Normal. Fig rust. Um, okay. only harmless, normal part of the cycle for our area. They get spots on the leaves. Yep. They'll leaf back out. You might even have little figs. I have no figs coming up. That's the Reba crop. Um, we don't have a long enough growing season for them to ripen mostly, but sometimes they do. So I've, I've got two trees at home that just did that. So, so okay. Yep. Just let it, let yep. it happen. Let it roll. Yeah, it is a nice mulch. <laughs> yeah, it does kind of mulch on the tree. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? I know that was a lot. You guys can always uh, get a hold of me via email. I'm working a lot with fruit growers and most all of them here, so happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you.